20 years since these two legendary players were selected second and third overall by the Vancouver Canucks. It's also impossible to overstate the impact that they have had on the Vancouver community. As good as they were as players, they're even better people. We are The New Jersey Devils are proud to select from the U.S. program, Jack Hughes. The 2019 the Vancouver Canucks draft from St. Petersburg of the KHL, Vasilya Paskova. We'd also like to say a special hello to the greatest hockey fans back in Calgary. Fred <laughs> here, welcoming the Boston Bruins to the stage. First of all, I'd like to thank the city of Vancouver, the Vancouver Canucks for their hospitality. Shout out to Maple Ridge. I'm going to have a fellow British Columbia Dean Malcock select our pick. The sights and the sounds of the National Hockey League draft in Vancouver, British Columbia. Some of the things we'll get into, there were some surprises, there was some shocks, there were some trades, and there was maybe some head-scratching. But we are going to solve all of your problems today. Welcome to Agree or Disagree, the podcast hockey edition NHL draft recap. My name is Kevin Olenek. Of course, you can follow me on Twitter at K-E-V-O-L-E. You can subscribe to all podcasts on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. Uh, and, of course, KevinOlenek.com. Now, uh, with us today, of course, uh, we woke him up, apparently, because he thought we were supposed to record, be recording on his time, not our time out here in B.C. So, good morning. Do you have enough coffee in your coffee cup yet, Sean. Did you just no, roll I out of bed? No, I do not, get... but uh, that's fine, and uh, <laughs> good morning to you guys. <laughs> good morning. Now, we also, we have a, actually, Sean, we, we have a, uh, we have a, a, a criminal <laughs> <laughs> yeah. in the midst of our, uh, of our, uh, um, although not his fault, uh, not in ter- Terra's, Tyler is actually with us right beside me in recording. Hello. Good morning, guys. Yeah, so Kevin's reference there, you know, I said the door would be open last night, yes. got back here to Richmond, the door was not open, tried to call Kevin, radio silence, <laughs> so I just climbed the front deck and came through the balcony door. Yeah. <laughs> it was well, remarkably easy, actually. <laughs> it was, well, I... I I, I, yeah, I d- thought the door was open, and I just fell asleep, and then I, I turned and looked at my phone, and I'm like, oh, crap, yeah. <laughs> and I run out, I run out, and lo and behold, there's this man is sitting in the couch, just all calm. <laughs> he, he was shocked. You could have to see his face, like, what? Wait, how'd yeah. you get inside? <laughs> oh, my God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh. I, like, <laughs> I have my tricks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so there's a couple of lessons learned there. Uh, so what we're going to do today, of course, is we are recapping um, 
I don't want to say that this was an eventful NHL draft because I, I don't think from that perspective it was really super eventful. Uh, I think we're about to head into an eventful week, but there were some events that happened that I think we'll we'll get into that were quite surprising, quite entertaining. We do have a couple of polls up uh, if you're interested, uh, and I did this prop purposefully. We'll get into this from a Canucks perspective because I got, wanted to kind of compare where the fan bases were because. Uh, Oilers fans were not super excited about the idea of who they drafted. We'll get into that. So I did with the Oilers question we did, uh, we have is Oilers fans, uh, after this weekend's NHL draft, do you feel that like Ken Holland has the Oilers on the right track? And as of right now, the majority are, is yes, no, let's wait and see are yes. And the Canucks fan poll question is after this weekend's NHL draft, how much trust do you have in Jim Benning and being a good GM? More, less, and the same is pretty much is leading on that as of right now. So you can go on to my Twitter at K-E-V-O-L-E, and we will, and you can vote on that. But we'll get into that more as we go on here. Uh, of course, Tyler and I were at the draft. Sean was watching with Chris and Heidi. Sean, how, how what was it like? How was the TV ex- viewing experience at the NHL draft? Um, well, I was at the uh, <laughs> the the, uh, the Calgary unofficial uh, Canucks bar, uh, the Pig and Duke, and it was uh, it was good. Uh, it was fun to to uh, watch and. And see the uh, all the reactions of the fans in in Vancouver, and the uh, the, the great heel promo that uh, Bradshaw Living uh, <laughs> pulled off. But yeah, it was good. It was uh, Sportsnet did, did did a good job at uh, at providing uh, all the insights that you needed in the draft. So. Yeah, we uh, we over we were sitting near the uh, where Sportsnet and NBC were uh, uh, were kind of side by side uh, on the is that the south end? I have trouble with the orientation. It's the end opposite the uh, Olympia. Yeah, uh, and I think it's the actually the east end of the building. Yeah, the east end of the building there. Uh, on the left was the Sportsnet side. On the right was the NBC Sports Network side. Um, and that was so. It was kind of fascinating watching that. Uh, there were a lot of jerseys, a lot of different jerseys. Mm-hmm. Um, I was actually there was a lot of Devils representation. Yeah, we had a couple of people in our section that were uh, Devils supporters and quite hardcore about yeah. it. Um, and uh, so, obviously, excited to hear the name Jack Hughes called first. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then as it turned out uh, on day two of the draft, they uh, added even more with yeah. uh, the acquisition of PK Subban. Yes, so they're probably very happy there. Tyler took a picture of the Peyton, uh, Peyton Krebs family as well. Uh, we, we, I'm pretty Peyton. sure. Yeah, yeah. We were walking outside the arena there, Sean, and uh, going past gate eight, and all of a sudden, uh, somebody's handing me a phone to take a picture of the family. So I hope they like the photos. <laughs> <laughs> it all happened really fast. Didn't yeah. even didn't even get their names. Kevin wished them good luck though. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So then we went through. We'll go through the draft here. Um, of course, I don't think that there was much surprise at the beginning. Of course, Jack Hughes was the first pick. I don't think anybody was surprised by that. Capo Caco number two. That was not a surprise. We all, that was all prediction, predictioning. Number three was when I think was the first mini surprise with the Chicago Blackhawks taking Kirby Doc. Uh, on a scale of one to ten, how surprised were you guys at that? I was quite surprised. Um, I didn't, uh, I thought that uh, Turcotte and Byram had a uh, sort of etched out a little mini tier and uh, with, uh, Doc coming up and sneaking in there definitely was a, a surprise to me. Yeah, I was also surprised by that. And as soon as the words were out of Stan Bowman's mouth from Saskatoon to the WHL, you could hear the surprise in the crowd. <laughs> like, I hadn't even said the name yet. People were surprised. They were expecting either Byram or Turcotte for yeah, sure. Yeah. And I think they were kind of – I kind of got the sense that the, the fan base was was waiting and hoping for Bo and Byram in a sense here. But they would get him and pick four as Colorado got that. I think – I think for Colorado, uh, I know this is a really great pick. I love this defense. Um, 
Uh, with Makar and Byram, I think that that's a pair that we're going to see for a really long time. And I think, I think uh, from a Colorado perspective, I th- thought that that was a really good pickup. Yeah, I mean, you know, we there's the three big names for Colorado up front there, uh, you know, yeah. that, so they, they, they're pretty secure that way. Uh, maybe an avalanche fan would have liked to see, you know, a forward in the first round, just to, just to give them a little more, uh, oomph, uh, with high end, uh, prospects, uh, at the forward position. But, uh, no, I mean, uh, picking a defenseman, uh, of, of Byram's caliber is obviously a, a great move for them. Just a quick aside, I mean, uh, Colorado had a couple of picks in the first round, so we got to see Joe Sackick up on the stage yes. twice and very well He was received. very well received, yes. yes. He, was not, he, was, he was not booed in any way, shape, or form. Booty yeah. Joe has, still has the hearts of Vancouver. Yeah, quite the opposite to the Edmonton, Calgary, and Boston representation. Yes, yes. very <laughs> much different, very different. Uh, then... Um, Sean, did you have any thoughts on Byram? Oh no, it's very very similar to what Tyler said. The uh, the pairing of uh, of Byram and um, a Makar are just just going to be giving uh, teams fits for for years. Yeah, yeah. And I think the LA Kings might have said thank you, Chicago, very much with their pick of Alex with selecting Alex Turcott. I think that they're going to be very happy with that. Uh, his dad was in the crowd. Uh, nice little moment there. Then the shock. I think that this was the shock of all shocks in this draft. Uh, the Detroit Red Wings and Steve Eiserman also got a very nice ovation. And I was about to tweet that you don't boo Steve Eiserman. I think it is now. It is a hockey commandment. Thou shall not boo Steve Eiserman. You can't do it. Yeah, assemble two gold medal winning teams. Yeah. Like, just the guy was something. But um, I think that I wonder if there's going to be some people in Detroit that might boo this pick. Maurice Sider which I think many mock drafts had in the, the 20s, was pick number six. Uh, I was, we were stunned. I, I can, oh, yeah, that, that was a reach. Yeah. Now, I believe if I saw the TSN Quizmaster said that uh, Bob McKenzie's first 18 went in the top 18, although yeah. in, in not in the same order, yeah. but so at least he was a top 18 selection in Bob McKenzie's mind, but yeah. Boy. Yeah, it was a huge surprise. Um, I think I had him sort of going in the in the teens, and uh, and but not, and but uh, I know Cam Robinson had him as his second defenseman, but uh, you when you uh, but everyone sort of thought that there was that the tier of forwards were uh, like maybe a half step a, or a full step ahead in terms of. Uh, your the the ceiling that you would expect out of them. So yeah, the that was a huge shock for, to see uh, Steve Eiserman uh, go up there and uh, pick a Maurice Sider at six. Now, Sean, at this point, because there was sort of I don't know if you, you know that so Tyler can talk about this as well. There was sort of the, the crowd was buzzing at this point because this really changed where the Canucks were, who the Canucks were about to draft. And there was a little bit of well, I heard whispers of people like Trevor Zegers, Trevor Zegers. What was the crowd? What was going on at the Pig and Duke? Um, yeah, well, I think when I walked in, um, the owner Stephen Loudon uh, came up and was asking me who I thought, and I I was still thinking do a hook at the one before the draft, and then when um, Detroit picked uh, Maurice Sider, I thought that there was a potential. That Zegres could drop, and uh, but I just I wasn't I, I still still thought that that was the long shot. So I felt like the the crowd was optimistic about Zegres as well because when Anaheim selected him right ahead of the Canucks, there was there was a a, a reaction of disappointment with yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. So. Uh, number seven, of course, was Dylan Cousins from the Lethbridge Hurricanes. Uh, I don't think that's much of a surprise. I think it's a, a, a good pick. I, I think he'll be fine. The Oilers, uh, to the rumor mills uh, surprise, no, not, not I, opposite. This was the hot expectation that the Edmonton Oilers would pick Philip Broberg. And, man, you thought Canucks Twitter. We'll get into Canucks Twitter in a little bit here, but Oilers Twitter was scratching their heads at this one. Um, but I feel like Oilers Twitter has, has had a couple of sleeps that have calmed down. But I... Um, I think Ken Holland remembers a certain left-handed shot defenseman from Sweden that he drafted before. Um, 
he sees. I don't. I mean, I, I don't think he's comparing this guy to Nicholas Lidstrom, but um, I, I, in one sense, the Oilers don't have this type of defenseman. Not like this guy that can jump up into the play, skates really well. I mean, it seems to me like there's a lot of questions about him, and I know that Cam Robinson had him in the twenties, but if I can also understand what the Oilers are thinking here, though. Yeah, he's a very toolsy player. Um, I know that uh, the Canucks were quite high on him, and that w- that worried the uh, the fan base, which is why you got that big cheer uh, yeah. when Pro Burke was picked by the Yeah, by it, the it was pretty much like, oh, yes. <laughs> we are going to pick it up, yeah. Um, and I think there's just the worry that his – the he doesn't think the game um, correctly – and while he has all the, the physical tools, the, the the mental game isn't isn't there. It won't uh, he won't be much more than uh, maybe just a a left shot version of Adam Larson. So I think that's the worry with uh, Broberg. Oh boy, that, that's yeah, that's not going to sit well with Oilers fans. I, I would simplify this even more. I mean, heaven forbid they draft a defenseman in the first round. <laughs> yeah. You know, like and and Ken Holland's been pretty clear. You know, um, knows that they need forwards. They know knows that he needs somebody that can work with McDavid. But um, you know, he's, he he believes you. You don't have a chance at winning anything if you don't have good defense. So he wanted to start with building from the back end, and I applaud him for that. Okay, so would you have taken Bo- Broberg or Col- Caulfield here? If I were Edmonton, yeah. Well, I think the the easy sell with the fans would have been Caulfield, but you have a new general manager coming in with with a mandate for change, and and uh, you know, uh, I I I think when you have a, a a good skating defenseman still on the board, I think you got to do that, especially with a team that struggles to defend. I would have been fine with Caulfield, and probably would, would have gone there. Um, I'm on the the same way wavelength as uh, as Cam Robinson in the fact that I just don't see the high end of of Broberg. I just don't think he thinks the game quick quick enough. And and like I said, I, I he could just be a left shot version of Adam Larson when th- all things are said and done. Uh, good skater, uh, big big guy, uh, has all the physical tools, but I just don't think he's got the the, the mental game to be to be a, a top pair defenseman, and that's what you would be looking for at that pick. Yeah, it, it will be interesting going forward because I mean, one of the stories it was is, uh, of course, the USHL is a big story here. But Cole Caulfield did drop further than a lot. I think some people had him um, here, uh, but then of course the, there was the disappointment the Anaheim got to did end up taking Trevor Zegers, which I I do think that there was a lot of Canuck fans disappointed. But then this disappointment turned into a number of emotions when Francisco Aquilini stepped up to the podium and Don Cherry did this. The actual pronunciation was Vasily Podkolzin. Um, I, I don't know what Aquilini pronounced. That, that was, that was uh, Stan Smeal. Was that Stan yeah, Smeal? Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. And, and that pronunciation... Uh, you know, it almost sounds so specific, like maybe, <laughs> maybe he got it from the maybe. family or something. But it's not. It's not what everybody else has been saying. They've been yeah, saying. maybe he did not Don Cherry. That. Maybe <laughs> I just Don Cherry that. <laughs> yeah, and you know, and of course, sorry about that. I thought it was. I, I oh. remembered actually by brain. Yeah. Vasily Pod Coles and uh, you know, when that name was announced, there definitely was a mixture of. Of shock, surprise, maybe some disappointment. Not sure what was happening. Uh, I don't think that was a name the majority of people watching had in their head <laughs> prior yeah. to the pick being made. Um, uh, but then again, uh, you sort of think right away back to the World Junior Tournament held in Vancouver, and that was a name that stood out for Team Russia. Yeah. Uh, you, you, but you know, you talk about how I wish I was shocked that Tyler was on the couch. You should have seen his face when this pick was <laughs> Yeah, I was just like, what's happening? <laughs> yeah, what's going Because it was kind of a, it was like a little bit of a hush, and then all of a sudden the crowd just, whoo, everyone kind of cheered. What was what was going on at the Pig and Duke, Sean? What was... Well, yeah, I, I sort of jumped up and, and gave a fist pump because I didn't think that the Canucks would go there. I didn't think that they would be um, willing to, to, to wait the two years that Pod Colson's going to take uh, in, in Russia. I didn't think uh, they would uh, go go Russian with the the quote unquote Russian factor, which I think is an actual a bit more of a myth than the actual reality. 
But uh, and then with the players left on the boards, uh, Matthew Boldy was still left, Uhick um, was still left, Peyton Krebs was still left. I thought one of those guys would be be their pick, but uh, I'm absolutely thrilled with the the, the Pod Colson pick. I think him his game is going to fit in really well with uh, the way that they're trying to build this team. Uh, I think that his uh, he's got a very a really high upside if he can figure out the offensive side of the game. And uh, he's not afraid to be uh, to play just a little safer and defend more defensive. I think there's a lot of uh, young players uh, they cheat a lot, a lot more because they need to because they they feel they need to perform offensively. But uh, Bud Colson's not doesn't play that way. He plays a, a real 200 foot game without uh, really sacrificing the offensive side side of things. So I think that. His uh, his upside and what he brings to the Canucks is something that they they don't have, and something that uh, will be a, a, a huge addition to this team going forwards. Yeah, absolutely agree that he, he fills an organizational need. I think the thing that obviously uh, is an issue for fans is they're looking for more immediate help, and it may not be for at least a couple more years. Uh, with uh, two years left on his uh, deal with St. Petersburg in the, in the KHL. Um, but then again, you know, if you look at it this way, uh, Russian players are generally not interested in coming over to North America and playing in the AHL. So you give them a couple more years to develop at home in the comfort of the KHL and then come over and go right into the Canucks. That that may time out very well for them. Yeah, and I also think, too, if there are issues in the AHL uh, with, with the Utica Comets, um, maybe have not having Paul Cozen through, going through that might be a benefit for him as well. Um, but I, I, yeah, I think it was it was a shock, but I think it was a pleasant surprise for the for the most part for for the Canucks fans. And I think all, overall they're they're quite excited about that. Um, and I think that as well they should be. I, I think he has the potential to be a top three forward with this team uh, for years to come. So. Uh, and Sam Cosentino on Sportsnet, evidently, uh, his first reaction was uh, steal for the Canucks. Yeah. So, and that may have changed the Twitter reaction fairly quickly as well. I, I don't know, but uh, um, I wasn't thinking steal myself. I was just trying to process it, as Kevin pointed out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I, Cam Robinson tweeted it was a, it was a good pick, and, and the boy genius also tweeted it was a good pick as well. So I think, I think that kind of calmed, calmed the storms a little bit there. Then we had our first trade. Uh, the Arizona Coyotes and the Philadelphia Flyers swapped picks. Uh, Arizona went to 11, Philadelphia went to 14, and uh, Arizona or Philadelphia got the 45th pick. This was the only trade in the first round, which uh, I don't know. I ended up not being too surprised by that because usually the first round there isn't a lot of activity. But. There was last year a little more than usual, so. Uh, combine that with all of the uh, media speculation and hype and all the talk about, oh, the Canucks are looking to make a splash. I mean, every time uh, Gary Bettman showed up to announce another pick, it was just like this, where's the trades? Where's the trades? Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes, yeah, that was, so this was the only time Gary Bettman said that we had a trade to announce. So, uh, and the only time he was cheered. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. was pretty much it. Yeah. Uh, But Arizona ended up with their uh, picked Victor Soderstrom. Uh, Matt, Minnesota picked, ended up with Matthew Boldy. Uh, is this a steal for Minnesota? Did they? I, there is, I think Soldierstrom was a bit of a, I was surprised that, uh, Arizona traded up to pick up Soldierstrom. Yeah. Um, I, was, that, yeah. I thought that he, he could, he could have been available at 14. So, uh, I think, uh, a little bit of a steal for Minnesota and, and Boldy and the fact that, uh, I, I think he, He's in that same range as everyone else, but uh, I just thought that uh, uh, Arizona uh, didn't didn't need to trade up to to get Soderstrom. No, we had him a lot lower in our mock draft, if I remember correctly. Yeah, we did. Yeah. If only we took notes for that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I I saved the list, but it's on my computer at home. <laughs> I got it. Yeah, all right. <laughs> nice job. <laughs> Somebody's on the ball Someone's here. Someone's on the ball here. Yeah. Uh, then. And I, I, I kind of was thinking this would be the p- place here was uh, Spencer Knight was taken by Florida. Uh, here, um, I didn't think it would last past twenty. Uh, he landed here. Cam York it, it ended up in Philadelphia, and then Montreal. 
uh, they did a really smart thing as well because Bergevin wasn't necessarily booed or cheered, but they did get a pretty loud cheer when they brought up Shea, Shea Weber to uh, announce to pick up Cole Caulfield. Uh, yeah, I think that this is going to be a very interesting pick in, in Montreal. Uh, I guess it's going to really depend on what you think, uh, how hockey is going to be played in the future. Uh because I think there's a lot of conversation of like that you see how the St. Louis Blues won the Stanley Cup of a guy like Cole Caulfield fits. Uh, I guess that's going to depend. Um, but the guy just seems to know how to score goals. So it's for Montreal, a guy like that in a market like that, it might be hard to pass that up. Yeah, it's a, it's a good, it's an interesting pick for sure. Um, especially when you look back at what the, the knock on the Montreal Canadiens has been for years is that they aren't big enough. And then they go out and, and draft a five foot seven Cole Caulfield. So yeah, they, uh, there's certainly some reaction on the Twitter about that. Um, I, for me, I just, it's, I, I can't fathom how he fell that low. You know, he was actually picked after a goalie. <laughs> so I wonder if there's uh, some, something else uh, sort of, you know, beneath the surface that, that uh, made teams reluctant about picking him. Oh, maybe, but I, in once you get into the, the eight to so much range or even we'll, we'll throw it six, six yeah. down. It's just basically who you, who you liked the best. Mm-hmm. And he may have been second on, on the many of those teams lists, yeah. but they still, they still had someone available that was ahead of him. So, um, yeah, well, having Sider, Soderstrom, and Knight getting picked ahead of him just basically, I think, is more of uh, who, who you liked better. Yeah. More yep. than, more than a, a knock against uh, Cole Caulfield. Yeah. Then Colorado, with their second pick, it took out took the uh, Alex Newhook. I, I like I, I think this is a good pick for Colorado. Yeah, and another one uh, well celebrated uh, when announced. Yeah. Yeah, the Newhook. Uh, the New Hook fan club was a, a very ruckus uh, <laughs> club that was uh, got a lot of uh, got, a, got a lot of play on Twitter and uh, social media. Yeah. Uh, then the Winnipeg Ice product. That's hard. It's just unusual to say that Winnipeg is in the WHL, but Peyton Krebs uh, was picked up by the Vegas Golden Knights. I don't. I. I they were probably the, one of the fastest at the stage. <laughs> Honestly, yes, yeah. they yeah. were like, yeah, it was, it was not. I think it was at least a minute left on their time before they came up. I mean, they were quite, they, they seemed quite excited to get Peyton Krebs, and as well they should. I think they got the right guy. Yeah, that's a that's a great pick at seventeen for Vegas. I think he he fits again, sort of the style that they play, yeah. uh, a very uh, north south game, and. Uh, very uh, willingness to go into the into the corners and 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 bang. So I think it's a very good pick for them. Yeah. And then Dallas picked, uh, and they picked Harley Thomas. <laughs> uh, no, his name is <laughs> the, uh, the poor poor man uh, that they had making that pick. Um, just I, I think he was just kind of thrown off. Uh, oh, here, just make a pick. It was Thomas Harley from Mississauga, uh, defenseman from the Mississauga. Uh, there, then Ottawa picked Lassie Thompson from the Kelowna Rockets. I think some would say that this was a bit of a reach as well because he was a little bit lower on a lot of people's radar. Uh, but and then the Winnipeg Jets picked Billy Hanola from uh, Luco, and then the, the Pittsburgh Penguins I think reached a little bit with Samuel Poulin. He was a little bit lower down on a lot of people's uh, board. Uh, the, the LA Kings from the Toronto Maple Leafs having Toronto Maple Leafs first pick. Uh, first round pick Tobias Bornford. Uh Simon Holstrom was picked by the Islanders. Philip That's Kulte. another bit of a reach, I think. Yep. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, and Nashville picked Philip Tomasino. Uh, the Winnipeg or the Washington Capitals picked Connor McMichael. And the Calgary Flames picked a guy that they have compared to Brad Marchand, which I'm sure is going to that name excites Vancouver Canuck fans to no end. Mm-hmm. But they picked uh, Jacob Pelche. Um, I don't know for me. I think it's a good pick. I'm concerned about his his size, but it sounds like from the interview that this is a guy that I think they uh, they need a little bit more of. Uh, they need a little bit more of that Matthew Kachuk drive and bring people into the game. He seems to be that kind of guy, so I like that from the, the that perspective. Uh, his height is a question, but 
I don't know. We'll see. We'll have to see about that. It, yeah, if, if if he's uh, if you're if you're five foot nine and you're playing uh, that that style of hockey, it, it can wear on you. So uh, they better uh, make sure that he doesn't uh, wear out too early. But uh, if that's if that's his comparable, then that's uh, someone who should be they they can get excited for. Well, and I, I, the other thing that I'm always a little bit concerned of, and I, is is with the Q. I mean, they get a lot of goals. There's a lot of guys with like some really offensive high potential here, but I, I don't know if their game necessarily from the three. I, I would be interested to talk to some people who who may be smarter than me in this. It feels to me the QHL seems to have the most difficulty adjusting to the NHL. Like and that's unscientifically proven by me, but I always we always see a lot of high scoring QHL players go in the first round, and, we, and we're like, oh, we're really excited about that. But they don't seem it doesn't always translate as quickly as some other places. I don't know if you guys agree or disagree with me on that. Um, yeah, the Q has, it historically has been more of a higher, uh, a more high scoring uh, league, um, as well as they seem to have a, a lot more. Um, discrepancy between the top end teams and the bottom end teams so i think uh, that 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 plays into it as well mm-hmm. um and yeah i i think it plays a little bit more they play a little bit more of um uh quote-unquote european style a little more free-flowing than the ontario and, and whl uh leagues so i think it's uh they they can uh depends on the player though yeah then Adam, oh, were you going to say something? Okay. Uh, then Adam's foot's son, Nolan Foot from McClellan Rockets, was taken by the uh, Tampa Bay Lightning, which we'll talk about in a little bit here. Then so they have two good feet now. They have two good feet. There we go. <laughs> you guys. <laughs> how, how long were you waiting to put that joke in? <laughs> well, as soon as I saw that was coming up, I was like, all right, let's get this going. <laughs> right, there we go. Uh, then Carolina, I really liked this pick, Ryan Suzuki. Um, this was, a, I think, a, a minor steal here because I think people had him higher. So I think it was a good pick for Carolina. Uh, uh, and then Anaheim from Buffalo picked Braden Tracy from the Moose Jaw Warriors. And then the – I'm not sure – if you heard who the Boston Bruins picked through the entire booing of that entire thing, but it was John Beecher. Uh, from <laughs> Which the is the most Boston name ever. Yeah, 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 yeah pretty much. <laughs> Another one out of the uh, U.S. National Development Program. Yeah, that is that is quite a, that is quite something. Yeah. That is, let's count that because that's pretty much one. We had Caulfield at two, two Spencer Knight, Matthew Boldy, four, Cam York, uh, Zegris, and, Turcotte, and of course uh, Hughes. Hughes. So that's yeah. that's that's, that's quite the uh, quite the output for that program. Yeah, that is something. Yeah. All in the first round. Yeah. I, I just want to make a comment on the whole thing with uh, the Bruins making their pick. Like it's uh, it's disappointing that you know that kid's dream moment of being picked is is drowned out by salty fans. You know. Like it, I, I, I was okay with the idea of booing the the announcement of it's Boston's turn to pick, but once they're up on the stage making the pick, I, I kind of wish people would have let it go. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, I was in the crowd, and you know, I'm I'm not that jazzed about Boston either, but I wanted to hear the pick. <laughs> it was hard to. I, I, if there's one takeaway, Sean, from this from this first round of the draft, it is that Canucks fans are a salty bunch. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they are. Now, to be fair, when they, when um, when they reannounced the name of John Beecher, there was an applause in the crowd. But during the pick, it was it was a boo. Um, and I and I I, I I can see your point there. I think yeah. like this is a really big opportunity. But you know, you put beer. Sometimes, if you put beer in people's hands. <laughs> yeah, it can happen. I yeah, guess. well, I gotta give the fans some credit. They all have the energy. Two and a half hours yeah. into this thing, <laughs> yeah, because at this point, uh, between up to twenty six, it was pretty much a snooze fest. Like when the the, the crowd changed when Brad Treliving got on and did the uh, 
did his did his the greatest fans in the world savage <laughs> uh, like but other than that it was like it was really quiet at that yeah. time. like there was it was pretty much dull dreams now the other story i i before and then the final pick was ryan johnson uh from sioux falls another usa ushl mm. but not from the under 18 team but. yeah just a note picked by uh buffalo yeah. uh that was st louis's yeah. pick um there were, were a lot of fans that exited after number 10. Not a yeah, bunch. yeah, there was, there was, yeah, it, it, was it thinned, it thinned it for thinned, sure. But yeah. it wasn't like huge. It was, it was probably less than I expected, to be honest. They were probably the people that got the tickets for $27. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 not like, yeah. No, not like other people. <laughs> yeah. So that was basically the day one. Gary Bettman said, thank you. Bill Daly will be presiding. Booze continued. Yeah. Uh, we, took pictures and then went went on a merry way. Mm-hmm. Then t- yesterday happened and we started with uh we'll just go through quickly the th- the three trades and then we'll we'll talk quickly about the kind of picks overall here but there were uh, three trades. Patrick Marlowe of course was traded to Carolina uh and uh Carolina is getting back a first round pick conditional on uh, a, f- a number of things here, uh, which we'll get into a little bit here. I think um, uh, I think that this is, in some senses, maybe where the frustration was. But uh, but Marlo, I, by the way, who did a really nice thank you letter to the Maple Leaf fans on Twitter last night through his wife. Uh, but um, Marlo is uh, off to Carolina with the expectation that he's going to be bought out for uh, San Jose. But it does solve a lot of uh, solves a lot of problems for Toronto for Toronto in terms of their cap, and I think Carolina did a pretty shrewd move overall. There, any comments on that one? No, that was that was a good trade by Carolina. Um, as you said, it's basically they basically got paid a first round pick to uh, buy Marlowe out for the for the Leafs because they d- didn't have room for him. Or the uh, the buyout, uh, uh, well, because he's a thirty five plus pro- contract, his his buyout doesn't do anything other than um, uh, take um, give give the team a, a roster spot back. So yeah. Um, the the other yeah, the Leafs didn't have the the cap room for that with with uh, Marner, Kapanen, Janssen to all sign. So uh, there's no uh, that that was a that was a good move by. Uh, by Carolina to pick up a second round, a second first round pick for them, either in 2020 or 2021. Yeah, and if you're Carolina, I mean, you got to get a first round pick or something high end like that out of the deal, knowing that uh, the Maple Leafs are so desperate to clear up some cap space. Uh, I, I mean, I, I comment on you know another first round pick goes out the organization for Toronto that didn't have a first round pick on Friday night. Yes, yeah, right. Um, you know, it's 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 the Leafs being the Leafs again. You know, I just uh, you know, he, at least uh, Kyle Dubas hasn't come out and done the Cliff Fletcher draft schmaft comments. But um, down the road, that may be a you know, it may be an issue for them. Yeah, uh, yeah, that it, that is interesting. I, 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 I I'm gonna wonder at some point here how much the boy wonder this boy wonder moniker is gonna gonna sit with him because I, I uh, gonna sit with uh, with Kyle Dubas I think I think they need to I think they need at least to get past the first round I think it's gonna be a very interesting season in uh, in uh, Montreal now the other trade that happened the second trade that happened was one that a guy that was in some ways connected to the Vancouver Canucks not extremely but PK Supan was traded to the New Jersey Devils for prospects uh, let me let me ask you this question. Based on the price the PK Supan ended up going for in New Jersey, and that New Jersey retained the entire salary, by the way, uh, was that price in Canuck land too steep? Was would it that you look at that? I mean, it's hard to do that comparison in some ways, but you look at what they gave up, New Jersey gave up. Would that have been something that you would have been happy the Canucks did to get PK Supan? I, I think it was uh, what would let's let's see what would the comparable be for the for the Canucks to be uh, like to basically let's let's just say Breezeball and Sotner for and two seconds for a fully uh, a full 
salary and, and cap hit PK Subban. I think I think they could have, but I don't think they were um, willing to take on Subban at that full salary is what it was. So I think that was the, the sticking point for the Canucks. Yeah, and I I think that you know New Jersey's uh, in more of a position to uh, give up some picks than the Canucks are. The other thing with New Jersey is that they um, they need to be making big moves to um, to keep uh, Taylor Hall, who is a, a free agent as of next summer. So uh, they need to do uh, moves like this to make a make a splash and make make him uh, make it more. Uh, uh, make it better, better, better looking for Taylor Hall to stay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. It's isn't it fascinating? Taylor Hall and PK Supan are now on the same team after a yeah. couple of years ago with that trade. Um, but then the Vancouver Canucks made a trade. They acquired JT Miller from the Tampa Bay Lightning in exchange for a uh, goaltender that was part of the uh, uh, goaltending rotation during the injury uh, there. Uh, a third round pick and a uh, conditional first round pick. Now, if you, uh, there was a lot of excitement, I think, during kind of Twitter uh, about the idea of bringing uh, JT Miller on. But then when they found out what this pick was, because it is a conditional first round pick, they there was some panic. Uh, I would, or panic. Panic, outrage, concern. Uh, so, uh, th- I think that this is just, it, it's its interesting because it, 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 I wonder if the, when Jim Menning is no longer the GM of the Vancouver Canucks, is this is a guy that could do, the legacy will be that this is a guy that ends up, no matter what he does, he could do no right. Uh, I... I and I'm, I'm looking at this maybe a little, from a little bit more of an outsider perspective, but I feel like this guy, no matter what he does in terms of trades, it feels to me he gets, oh, he gets real. There, this fan base is really critical on him. Oh yeah. Um. <laughs> well, let's let, let's just start here for with me. Here okay. I, I, oh said, yeah, because I think that we're going on soapbox, Sean. Here, I yeah. wanted my John Garrett size soapbox. Um. I was going to create a sound effect for you. I <laughs> Uh, the, the, the biggest issue with the, the way the fans reacted is that it's misguided. Um, the biggest issue, uh, with this whole regime has not been the fact that he's been, had this, been willing to go out and get players is he, he's gone out and gotten the wrong players in the past, uh, with the signings of like the Jay Beagles and the Antoine Roussels who, well, Roussel, I think actually turned out to be a, a very good addition. Um, but, uh, and then the, the trades, uh, Trading away um, Jared McCann and extra picks for Eric Branson, um, trading away extra picks for Brandon Sutter. Um, it, it is the his willingness to trade away picks, but not willing to bring extra picks in for. Uh, and when I say extra picks, I'm not the the sixth and seventh round, the sixth round picks, the fourth round picks that he has has aren't good enough. I think. Uh, what uh, the fan base has been wanting is to see extra second, third round picks, uh, or ideally a first, an extra first round pick within one or two years type deal um, to come in. And then when he ends up going out and trading the uh, first round pick uh, for JT Miller, uh, it just it, it people are just uh, baffled and, and angry and all that. Um, the actual price for JT Miller in this trade, I don't think is that bad. I think it's maybe a slight overpay, but uh, when you look at what he brings, um, he's about a 40, 50 point uh, player, uh, plays a physical game, can play all three, four positions. He's actually coming off a down year uh, scoring wise, but he's been normally a 20 goal scorer. I think it's a very good addition to the, to the Canucks. Uh, He's, he'll be able to play on either, either, either line with uh, uh, Horvat or Pedersen. Uh, You're just looking at someone who can, uh, really add something to the top six that they're desperately needing. It was the same thing with the Tanner Pearson trade. Uh, his his style of uh, straightforward uh, and, and physical style uh, was really missing in the, the Canucks' top six. So I think that uh, 
in, in all reality, the, the price that they paid to get JT Miller is fine. Um, I think the other issue, I think a lot of people were over um, overstating the the cap the cap trouble that uh, Tampa is in. Um, when you look at when you actually look into it, um, especially after the the Ryan Callahan injury news and the fact that he's basically going to go on LTIR, uh, they have the cap room. Uh, they only they only have one major RFA to sign, and that's Braden Point and uh, and. And then all they have left is uh, I think they got three, three or f- like three uh, forward RFAs that uh, have to get taken care of. But they 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 put together a, a grand total of thirty nine points combined. So you're not going to be paying much for them. And there's other ways to um, to to shed cap as opposed to giving up a top six forward who is cost controlled for four years at a very decent uh, 5.25 million cap hit. So I really think that uh, the, the, the outrage and um, that was, was shown by Canucks fans and media on social, uh, on, on Twitter uh, was, uh, was a, a, a very irrational overreaction because uh, of, of what I, of what I just said. And uh, it was, uh, misguided again, like like I said, I think it's just more of a uh, a lack of hit, of Benning getting extra picks, extra uh, sort of mid to high end picks, as opposed to the fourth and fifth and sixth round picks that he has been getting. So I really I really hope that uh, the the fan base can avoid uh, getting caught up in the acquisition price for J T Miller and just. Uh, get behind him because I think he's going to be an absolute fantastic player for them. Um, I got a soapbox a little bit too here. I, I, I just, I, yeah, I don't know. I I think it's just like the in thing to do now to crap on Jim Benning and, um, you know, there's, there's, there's valid criticisms there. I would agree with most people. I think this was a little pricey. Um, but look, do you want to make a trade or not? I think that's what it comes down to here. Like, people are screaming, make a deal, make a deal. And then if it's not, you know, getting William Nylander for a seventh round pick, people are screaming about it. Like, like you can't have it both ways, you know. Every team would love 31 first round picks, you know. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. like, it just doesn't work like that, you know. And which team is more, I always say this, which team is more motivated to make the deal, you know. In this case, I think the Canucks are more motivated to make the deal. And people are like, well, how can that be when Tampa Bay is in a cap crunch? Well, they don't have to make the the deal. You know, like Tampa Bay could look to make some other deal with some other team if they're looking for cap relief. But, the you know, the Canucks are looking for a, a forward that's going to help and versatile and, and isn't too old yet and comes affordably. And, you know, I think they got that. But, uh, yeah, they had to give up a few pieces to do it, um, including a third-round pick in the draft yesterday, which, you know, kind of speaks to what you, you're you getting at there, Sean, where, you know, they, they're lacking those kind of selections in the draft. Um, but if your drafting and developing is good, and I think a lot of people feel that the Canucks have uh, done a good job at evaluating talent, um, you know, don't uh, write off those, those fifth, sixth, and seventh-round picks. Yeah, because I mean, you do have to you do have to do your homework in terms of of those picks. I mean, those are important. I mean, I, I, it, there is a lot of work that goes into finding. Like, it's not just brainless. Like, when we do a fantasy draft, we're just uh, we're looking at at our sheet of paper. Like, oh, we'll take uh, uh, whoever. I think that there's a lot of research done by that. And you look at really successful teams in the NHL. Uh, they draft really well from four to seven, so that's important. Now, of course, the high end stuff is is you, you do want, uh, but at the same time, here you really look at what the Canucks gave up. They got they gave up a guy that was basically on loan to them for a couple of games to be uh, due to an emergency situation mm-hmm. and two equivalent draft picks. Um, I don't think that that's really. Is it a bit of an overpay? Maybe, but in the bigger scheme of things, what you're going to see from JT Miller, I mean, he's been a cons- he's a consistent 20 goal scorer right, in this league. I can't, I mean, yeah, he had a down year last year, but he was also playing on a team uh, with a bunch of talent on there. Um, I think he's going to get more ice time, which means probably more goals. So I think he'll, he he's a fine fit here. Um, 
And I also think this is also a little bit tough to evaluate this trade from the perspective that I don't think the Canucks are done. Uh, because there is a couple of other irons in the fire here. so Yeah, and I would say there, there's there got to be because they didn't take any defensemen in the draft yesterday. Uh, eight forwards and a goalie so um, in this draft. So surely there's something uh, still to, to happen, uh, whether through additional trades or uh, once free agency opens up. Um, yeah, I, I just a final comment, I guess, on the uh, first round pick, the conditional first. You know, if the Canucks make the playoffs next year, they they give up the pick, but that'll be in the bottom half of the draft. Yeah. And if they uh, don't make the playoffs, then it's protected and they keep their lottery pick. So, um, you know, I don't I don't think it's you know like when people hear first round pick, they they you know they're thinking may, sometimes you know a top five immediate NHL help, and that's that's not what we're talking about here. Yeah, it's and it, I just to, to, I mean they, they've done some research on there. I mean the majority of the first round picks will play at some point in the NHL, but it's not a guarantee that the first round pick that you're giving up is going to be a top uh, six guy or a top four defenseman or a number one goalie. That's not necessarily guaranteed. You look at what the Calgary Flames did a couple of, a number of years ago when they traded Jerome McGinley and Jay Bowmeister. They got three first round picks that year, and the only one that is uh, even that has been a regular in, in that lineup is Sean Monahan. So, um, the, I mean, it's it, the prudence there is on the Tampa Bay Lightning to select a really good first round pick. So, we'll see. I don't know. I think long term, this is a good move for the Canucks. And the other thing is that uh, if it's up to the Canucks to make sure that that pick is as low in the first round as possible, and you if if everything goes right and they're picking sort of bottom half of the set of the first round, you're looking at a player who's going to be two, three years away from being in an NHL anyways. Yeah. So um, say that, say the Canucks make it next year. So you're looking at two, three years away from there. If not, then it's, then if they're, if they can make it happen in 2020, then 20, 2021, then you're, you're looking at 24, 2024 by the time, uh, that that player comes in, and that's I don't I think that's that I don't think that's something that people are are re- really realizing and and uh, putting into their their uh, how they're they're evaluating this uh, this trade. And the Canucks, you know, they've never really you know stripped it down, scorched earth rebuild uh, over the last several years. They haven't done that, but. Uh, at this point, with uh, Elias Pettersson there mm-hmm. and a, and a new core and a new era, and the Sedin's gone. I mean, they, they, you know they they need to be getting people in there that are going to offer immediate help. And they the you know the first round pick and Pod Colson's not going to provide that. So they kind of had to make this move. You know, um, you've talked before, Sean, about how you know entry level contracts and Elias Pettersson's got two more years left on that entry level deal. I mean, you, you're hoping by year three, you're, you're a pretty good team, at least in the playoffs. Yep. And I think that's sort of how the, the, the approach they're taking, especially with the fact that Jim Benning is basically is on the last year of his contract and needs to make some big moves to, to, to get an extent another extension. So, um, but uh, we'll we'll see where it where it ends up. But I, I I'm okay with the 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 uh, the price for J T Miller because I think he's going to be a fantastic player for the Canucks. Can I uh, have a conversation with the Vancouver media here? Is, is this a little offside? Can I do this? It's your it's your show, Kev. <laughs> oh, well, uh, this might get me in trouble when I'm trying to get a job. Might be getting a job in the media, but like really like lines like this. Uh, the trade is controversial, to say the least. The Canucks are still a rebuilding team. Uh, Global News, we saw the highlight of a controversial... Like, that was the headline, like, yeah. like, I'm sorry, but this is... like I understand that you're trying to sell people to come on your website, but to call this trade controversial is, like... Absurd. I don't think that this is a controversial trade. It's a trade. It's debatable. It's a debatable trade. But all trades are, you know, like that's the thing. <laughs> like I, I just, you know, to like kind of it kind of creates this sort of this hyperbole with, you know, um I understand, you know, you gotta create conversation, but like um controversial, I I yeah, it, I, I feel that, that word is just it it's ridiculous to me. This is not a controversial trade. 
at all. This is a trade, you know. Um, I mean, I mean, you could argue the draft pick was more controversial than this trade in some ways, but that the draft pick wasn't controversial. Anyway, I just, you know, I I think I understand the need of selling newspapers and 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 getting people online and getting people to a website, but like, I. I what choice is not? Yeah, I don't here. know. I don't, I don't know. I wish you know, like somebody in the organization would come out and say that the fans don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> I mean, Ken Holland kind of went there yesterday. He uh, or on Friday night, actually. I, I guess there's a quote here from him saying, "The people who don't watch the game seem to have all the answers today." That's Ken Holland yeah. on Oilers draft critics, and I, you know, I think that's just a great comment. Yeah, like let like. Holy moly! Like the <laughs> like the average person is not nearly as connected as uh, as a general manager. Yeah, uh, there were a couple of other moves uh, that the, the Canucks made yesterday. They traded Drown. They traded uh, uh, Tom Pyatt and a sixth for a seventh rounder of Francis Perron. Those are basically a- AHL players, uh, uh, and then another draft pick. They de- dealt their fourth to the Buffalo Sabres for their 100. 120- Second selection and sixth uh, round selection. Um, so the Canucks ended up making nine picks, which I think overall is not terrible. Um, no, I mean, I, I, if if you're if you're lacking in quality, supposedly, we'll take some quantity as well. Yeah. Uh, who? Uh, I think the guy to watch for him in my mind is Nikos Hoglander, which a lot of people had a. As a first round pick, um, I think he's going to be a guy that I think the Canucks might see a little bit sooner rather than later. But is there any other people that are exciting you in particular here? Or? Well, yeah, Nas Hoglander is, is someone that uh, Canucks fans should get really, really excited for. He's uh, he's, a, he's a first round talent, um, are like one some of the best hands in the draft, um, can, and can can really skate. Uh, he's a little, he's a little smaller, but he he doesn't play at that. He, he plays a little bit bigger than the five nine that he is. So I think the Canucks should, and Canucks fans should be very excited for him. Uh, Ethan Kepin, um, uh, who, out of um, to Flint Firebirds, is is someone that I think is another uh, per, uh, player that the um, Canucks fans should keep an eye on. I think he could uh, could surprise and start pushing up the uh, the Canada. Um, world junior rankings um, uh, with uh, with with his play. He's a, a big big kid who can who who isn't afraid to go into the corners and and play uh, to be a physical four check. And uh, he's playing uh, with Ty Delandria, who's uh, uh, was a first round pick last year of Dallas. And uh, he, I think that uh, uh, that that was a very good pick. Uh, that the Canucks did in the uh, fourth round. I don't know how to say the last name, but Carson Folk or Folk. I'm not sure how you say it, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, the the you, yeah, you, the, you the, that the to make sure Sean says that yeah. The, you got a better idea there, Sean? <laughs> oh, sh- uh, I I think it. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> like the the filters just start yeah. beeping off in my head. <laughs> Anyways, uh, fifth round pick, 133rd overall, passed over uh, in the draft last year, but uh, uh, is from the Calgary Hitman. So we'll be playing with uh, Jet Wu. So that uh, should be uh, neat to watch as well. A couple of Canucks prospects playing for the Hitman. Um, you know, and seeing how they progress. Um, hopefully, the Canucks have a hit there. Um, and then nice to see them uh, select a goalie as well. Um, <laughs> you know, we were talking about that earlier uh, with Merrick Mazanik uh, mm-hmm. heading out in the JT Miller trade and how the Canucks got exposed badly on goaltending depth last year. Um, yeah, <laughs> you would have hoped to see a goalie picked in this draft. And uh, they did that with Arthur Silovs. I hope I'm saying that right. He's a Latvian goaltender and uh, was uh, was playing for Latvia at the World Juniors last year. Yeah. Uh, another one I, I think that uh, should be taking a look at is actually their last pick uh, at uh, at uh, number 20, 215, Arvid Kosmer. He's one of the younger players in this draft. Uh, he's still 17, and um, he was playing. He put up really good numbers in the uh, the J20 league in, in Sweden and uh, got, uh, got actually got a, f- a few games in playing for Le Comping. Uh, in the SHL, so I think it's uh, I think he he might be someone to 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 take a 
a look at and and follow uh, because I think he might be someone who could, would be uh, to, to surprise. And uh, there always seems to be one or two players that that have drafted that late um, to that, that uh, surprise and come in and, and are, are good impact players in the NHL. So uh, that's that's someone I'm I'm definitely going to be watching. Yeah, it uh, certainly will be interesting. Of course, development camp is coming up soon here as well. Uh, but no, no, next now will be is is the and I'm using air quotes here legal tampering because you know th- let's face it this happens more often than we care to admit. Uh, Jake Gardner is a name that has been common here, according to Steve Simmons. Uh, on here, high on Jake Gardner's list in free agencies for Florida, Los Angeles, Minnesota, and I'm using his words here, and of course Toronto. Uh, apparently the Habs will be in on this. Uh, JP Berry has said Vancouver is, will be in on that as well. Uh, they are expected to talk to Tyler Myers as well. Uh, as a story here, and I, yeah, I guess the reaction of not the Canucks taking, not taking a defenseman in this draft. Mm-hmm. That That's a big surprise for me. I mean, we, I was, I was wondering all along whether they'd take a defenseman with their first round pick. Uh, mm-hmm. So I think it's 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 almost a, a given now they're going to sign one in free agency. Rick Dollywall uh, had a tweet this morning saying that it uh, looks like the Canucks will be talking with uh, Tyler Myers' representation when the uh, um, discussion opportunity with free agents opens up. Yeah, yeah I, I'm not I'm not too worried that they didn't take a, a defenseman. I think there was that was another thing that I saw on social media that. Uh, uh, fans were getting all all twisted because they, they didn't take a defenseman, but uh, they signed uh, Josh Tevez and Brogan Rafferty this past year. They still have Ulevi. Um, they still have Jet Wu. They still have, um, uh, yeah, they still they still have enough uh, in in the pipeline right now. Um, but they still it's it's more, defense is more of a, a now need more than a future need, I think. So I think it's not not necessarily a bad thing that they did they did pick uh, a defenseman, and they they went in and they talked to to Judd Brackett and, and, and Jim Benning uh, about that, and it says more. It wasn't it, they they would have would have picked a defenseman had a, the a couple of picks fallen a little differently. So I don't think it's a a, bi- a big deal. Yeah, and then there's still a pretty good chance they'll be able to re-sign Luke Shen. Yeah, um, they of course re-signed Alex Edler. So, um, so if you look at the uh, depth chart, it's not as bad as it might have been. But uh, that's something uh, that's kind of like the biggest thing I'll be looking for is what they do about their defense here in the coming week. Yeah, I don't think depth wise they're they're in any any issue. It's the the lack of uh, uh, top end talent that's. Uh, really um an issue especially on the right side when uh you've got Troy Stetcher and Chris Tanev as your 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 top two I think it's just not it's not good enough in today's NHL I think they need to to add something there and it sounds like they're going to be adding uh looking to add Tyler Myers on that side and uh look forward to the overreaction to that signing uh, the the other name that has been bandied about here uh, is Tyson Berry. Uh, there were some speculations on Friday that that deal has been completed, but it looks like uh, something has fallen off the wayside and that it's not been completed. Of course, we, we don't know. Uh, where are you on that? What are you thinking at this point in time? Are you thinking, hmm, uh, Still, it's still a possibility, or is that ship is ship sailing for you? Uh, that ship has sailed. I think um, you're looking at uh, an acquisition price that's going to be too steep for the Canucks at this point. So, uh, I think that ship has sailed. I think had um, Pod Coles had not been there, I think there might have been a deal uh, available for the Canucks to uh, trade that tenth overall. Or trade down and uh, and get and get Tyson Berry, but uh, I think that ship has sailed now. I wonder in the draft going forward if we will ever see a team move into the top ten hmm. via trade. Um, just with the way things are now and the salary cap and um, the importance of having those top picks. Um, that that makes me wonder, you know, <laughs> will that ever happen? 
Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Sean. I I think it, I think it's going to happen. I think there's still still going to be teams who are who are willing to to move them for immediate help or or trade down and and because I think the other thing yeah is that this draft was very much a, a good example of it in the fact that it was so unpredictable. Maurice Sider yeah. as the biggest example. Um, I think that uh, a lot of people would have thought that uh, Detroit could have traded down two, three picks, <laughs> eight, nine picks, and still gotten him. So um, I think it's uh, it's something that uh, we're going to – I think it'll be year to year. Um, basis, uh, depending on how where the draft, uh, what the draft uh, board looks like, and how deep the draft is. Yeah, it's it is. I I, I, I can see both sides of this. I mean, you look at the NBA draft and uh, all the moves that were made there. I mean, there were trades all over the place. And that's I mean that creates excitement for the fans, but it also just I guess it's you know. The hockey's always been a little bit more. Con- We've talked about this a number of times. The hockey's a bit more conservative and that kind of thing. So um, they don't want it. I mean, I know that there's a need for the fan base to get splashes, but that's not always how GMs think. I mean, you know, as Ken, as Tyler pointed out with the Ken Holland quote, it's you know, it's you know, they're not necessarily thinking. I mean, they have a way of building a hockey team, and that is what they're going to do, and they're not necessarily going to necessarily stray, especially some of the old school guys. Um, you can see a Chaika or a Dubis or some of these young guys trying to do something a little bit innovative, but it's, you know, it's, it's tough for them to do. Uh, mm-hmm. And the other thing that was really a big sticking point, we didn't talk about this, but I do think the fact that they did not know what the salary cap was until yesterday had a lot to do with what trade. And that's just incredible. Like, how is that even possible? Like, that it would not be known before the draft starts. Yeah, I, they weren't, I have no idea. I don't think anyone really had a really good answer of what the exact reason was, but I think that that had a lot to do with what, uh, what was going on there. From what I understood, it was because uh, they were waiting on the uh, NHLPA to um, uh, decide on on the escal- how much of the escalator clause they were going to implement for the for the upcoming season. Because, uh, and that's really what it, that's really what, what it was. Because I with the uh, with escrow and all that, and I'm not exactly sure on the details, but. Uh, the, the NHLPA has the ability to um, up the up the uh, um, the salary cap using their this escalator clause um, by a certain amount. So I think uh, it was uh, a lot less than they originally thought that they were going to do as well. So hmm. well, I think they need to find a way to address that timing wise in the future because it does make you wonder: was that an impediment to some trades? Yeah, it sounded like it was. Um, it sounded like, from what I understand, that there's some floor groundwork going on, and we're going to have a busy week uh, in terms of trades. But I, I think a lot of there was a lot of things that ha- didn't happen because of it. But you know, uh, that was my led to understanding. So, but so the salary cap for those who don't know, it's now 81.5 is the cap. The floor is 60.2 billion dollars. So um, teams will know that. Uh, yeah. Anything else we need to cover? Uh, the other, the news that they're just kind of uh, broke just before we start. William Carlson was signed to an eight-year uh, deal in Las Vegas, but other than that, there has been no other moves going on. Uh, I expect this. I expect today and later this week to be quite busy, though. So, yeah, as we get towards uh, July first, uh, I think every day is going to heat up more and more with some news. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I, I think I think it's quite likely we see the Canucks make. Three or four transactions. You think I'm so? Gonna, I'm going to go out on the limb and say three or four transactions. I, I, I think, uh, I think the owner wants to see that. <laughs> you know, he went to Whoa. bat for the organization on the first round pick with a tweet supporting the selection of uh, Silly Pod Colson. But I, I, I think there's, uh, there's, there's desire from top to bottom to make some more moves. And well, I, one of those, I moves- think there's a. There, when you look at their roster too, uh, they've got thirteen, uh, thirteen forwards signed. Currently, and then that doesn't include Brock Besser, which makes it fourteen, and then you still got three other uh, R- uh, lower end RFAs that need uh, need need dealing with as well. So 
I think, yeah, there's definitely going to be a, I, I think four is a, is high. I think two to three, maybe uh, we'll see, but I think we'll definitely see a couple moves for, for sure uh, to move out some bodies and, uh, and free up uh, some roster space for the, uh, for the, the players that they have uh, that, that they have and, and uh, in their, in their, in their long-term plans. Uh, is one of the names gone Louis Ayers? I think so. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't see how he, he comes back. Um, just, yeah, I just, there's, <laughs> uh, it's all, it's all kind of scuttled, but it's yeah. out on the internet. All we, all we know is we had that one comment from Louis Erickson uh, to the Swedish media there earlier in the off season about him and the coach not getting along. I mean, I think it's just obvious when you have a big, contract like that and you're you're buried on the fourth line and you're a healthy scratch there's there's long-term implications there you know it's it's the same for James Neal in Calgary I just don't know how you know that works anymore when 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 that course of action is taken yeah uh yeah no that's that's true I just is it this week or is it later in the summer I think is going to be the question I mean I I would think especially after the fact that that Benny tried to call him according to Benny Benning tried to call Louis Erickson, and Erickson did not return his calls. Um, yeah, in touch with the agent, but not with the player directly. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, I I would think, I don't know, I, I think that may be put a little bit more of a priority, but whether or not that, that they could get that done this week is not, who knows. I, I think later in the offseason, I think, uh, yeah. you know, once the Canucks have acquired some other players that they, they, they really want, they have a pretty clear picture as to what they want to start the season with, then then they may be able to uh, to do it. Do you, just so, wait, do you think two or three, are you predicting four transactions in the offseason or the four transactions next week? In, in Total, yeah. In total, I mean, okay. In the, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was like, I thought you made, made it last for the week. No, like, no, that's a lot in one week Woo. for sure. Yeah. The, the team to look out for this week, though, is uh, is Vegas, um, with the, their signing of uh, William Carlson. That uh, looks like it's about five point nine million. They're going to be there are they were already at eighty three million uh, with the cap. So uh, there and they still have some other RFAs that they need to take care of. So I think you'll see them being busy this week. Yeah, I'm interested. Well, I mean, there's it's. Uh, there's lots to get interested about here. I mean, Toronto with Mitch Marner um, and sort of that, what's going to happen there. Oh boy, the networks are going to be winding up yes. the Marner watch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 actually, that's going to be interesting. How are you going to divide the Marner watch and the Kawhi watch? Like, how is that going to happen? Uh, 30%, 30%, yeah. and then <laughs> yeah. 40% on all other sports content. <laughs> Breaking news, Mitch Marner as talked to Kawhi Leonard. We have a report now at the Rogers Center at the Blue Jays game. Marner and Kawhi are both at the Blue Jays game. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> anyway. Uh, uh, but that's going to be interesting. I think Montre- a, team, a team that's hiding under the radar is Montreal. Yeah. I am very intrigued with their... I mean, I know that they're... I still don't think the Flames are going to get as much as people think for TJ Brody, but I think they're in on a couple of defensemen. Uh, they may end up signing. Uh, they may end up getting a Brody or a Letty or a Gardner. They may they may win that sweepstakes. Um, but I'm, they're kind of flying a little bit. Under yeah, the and, and and Brad Tree Living has, uh, I would say, a track record of liking to wheel and deal. So, yeah. Um, yeah, watch out for the Flames here in the next couple of weeks as well. Yeah. Is there anything we did not cover that we should have covered? Uh, nope. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, some more impressions, I guess, from inside the building on uh, on Friday night. Uh, uh, Calgary and Edmonton, not well received by the fans. Non-reaction for the Ottawa Senators. <laughs> so that was a little bit interesting. Same as the Winnipeg Jets. Yeah. So not as much hostility there from the fans towards uh, those those teams. Um just just neat to be there you know just uh it's very produced all the you know the effects and 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 just how big and glitzy it, it looked like you know it was it was a little weird watching without the analysis or without Pierre Maguire you know jumping to huge conclusions and <laughs> um uh can we make a comment on EJ Haraddick's oh, insight? Oh, air quotes, insight. So great. this wouldn't have come across the TV broadcast, but they had EJ Haraddick from the NHL Network offering insight before each pick was made while the clock was ticking. And it was 
This, yeah, but this <laughs> this was the insight. Okay, will the Senators pick a forward or a defenseman? We will find out. <laughs> like it was just it was just not insight. It was, it was, there was nothing. Oh, like, man. it was just filler, Sean. It was, it was filler. <laughs> and you know, I, I, I don't even think like EJ Heratic was comfortable doing what he was doing. It was just like not. Yeah, it was it was not good. But, Better than silence or just music, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but there was a lot of really well produced team videos on introductions and mm-hmm. historic drop picks and stuff. Um, and it looked to me like the team videos were produced by the individual teams. Yeah, you know there might have been some parameters that they had to follow in terms of length or content. But uh, yeah, they looked because they all kind of had a unique um, um, just feel to them. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, that was good. And then uh, Hannah Bernard, the Canuxian Arena host, who uh, apparently is leaving that post here uh, mm. after this season. Uh, she was doing uh, inter- interviews with uh, with all of the uh, first-round uh, selections there. But you, we weren't getting those interviews until, like, three or four picks later. Yeah. Um, so uh, when the Canucks pick came up, Pod Colson, uh, he used the translator. Mm-hmm. So that was a little bit of an awkward interview there. But uh, very well received when um, he appeared on the screen. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe the fans felt bad about the non-reaction there, <laughs> or the mixed reaction uh, when the pick was announced. Yeah. Uh, what else? The other. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was wondering if Nick had anything to do with the Flames production there, because there was a lot of Canuck highlights where the Flames were scoring goals on the Canucks. I just <laughs> <laughs> wondered if Nick Taylor had anything to do with that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I yeah it was I think. If, if you have a chance to get the, like, Calgary, Mr. Nenshi, Mayor Nenshi, I know you listen to this podcast once in a while. I know you, you follow me. Listen, try to make sure the draft comes to Calgary, too. Because I actually, it's a great thing. It was a great event. It really is. The, we got to see some, you got to see the prospects. We got to see Trevor Zegers as we're walking by. Dale uh, Hunter, we saw Dale We did, Hunter. yes. Yeah. Uh, I thought the the atmosphere outside the building prior to the draft on Friday night was, was great. Uh, they had Canucks alumni there doing yep. autographs. Uh, just even seeing the, the prospects walking down the street in their suits, uh, uh, a mixture of excited faces, nervous faces, the family there all fussing over the kids. You know, all that kind of stuff was really cute yeah. to see. Yeah, and you know, even as we were leaving the arena, there's some of the kids that were not picked, you could feel the disappointment on their face. And just yeah, see that. It's not easy, but I don't know. How did it come across on TV, Sean? Yeah, it was a pretty standard uh, uh, NHL draft uh, pro- production. So yeah, it was it was it was good. I have to say, seeing the two panels side by side there was quite the uh, the contrast there. I mean, Jeff Merrick, he's a great host, and uh, Liam McHugh for NBCSN does a great job. But when you look at the analysts, you know, it's Sam Cosentino, Louis DeBrusque, and Brian Burke versus Craig Button, Pierre Maguire, and Bob McKenzie. I mean, you can make your own judgment on yeah. whose panel was better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, uh, so coming up this week, we will be talking to Jess Fedigan uh, about as she has covered the career of Alex Newhook. So she's going to join me on Tuesday. If you guys want to jump on, if you have time, we'll, we can talk about that. But that will be good. And uh, some other Prince George prospects that were picked and not picked. Uh, there was a pretty high-end goalie for the pre- Prince George Cougars not picked. Uh, and she is there. They're quite, there was a, quite a conversation about that. Uh, Logan Neaton uh, was – or sorry, no, uh, Taylor Goche – was not picked in the NHL draft. So we'll kind of talk about what's going on there. Uh, we're hoping to get the Moncton Wild... There was a podcast on the Moncton Wildcats that has followed the career of Jacob Kelsey. We're sending that up as well. Do we have anything else on the pike? Uh, not that I know of. We have irons in the fire, but nothing confirmed. I think yeah. Is, is the way we are. So work on the phones. Work on the contacts. We're working, we're, we are Jim Benny. <laughs> uh, so Tyler, tell us how to follow you. On Twitter at T Noble T N O B L E, and I am Beardy Connect zero uh, three on Twitter. All right, and of course a shout out to Heidi who couldn't join us because she's out doing something. Uh, hide at baseball as well as well. Yeah. Uh, Just want to say, Kevin, you know, uh, thanks for accommodating me. This was uh, a lot of fun to. Uh... To come down and go to yeah. the draft with you and uh, sit side by side for a podcast or yeah, what? It was great. Now I just got to get over to Calgary and see Sean sometime. 
John and yep. Heidi and the whole gang and uh, a couple other terrorist people uh, as well that I know. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Maybe, I don't know when, but sometime. Yeah. Check out that Pig and Duke thing as well. Yeah, pig and Duke. <laughs> yeah. We could side by side with the Oilers YYC podcast. That, that would be something. That would be something. Yeah. All right. We will talk to you all very soon. Bye for now.